a title for today's conversation, and it is going to be more conversational. While we're going to walk through this, we're going to walk through it together. I don't have a formal, and this was intentional, I don't have a formal message to preach, as it were, to, you know, quote, quote, unquote. But I, I want to have a conversation through Hebrews, the glory of correction. We are living in a time and a season where, and this is, so let me just try to explain uh, let me pray first. Let me pray first, and then I'm going to try to give you an introduction to to why we're having this conversation today and possibly in subsequent days, uh, things that are connected to it. Father, this uh, afternoon, I, I'm so thankful for your goodness. I, I know, Lord God, there's a, there's a, if I sense anything in the Spirit right now, it's your great desire for us. And we don't want to come short of that great desire. What great desire you have for us, Lord. Just a longing in your heart for us. Oh, that you long for us to know you, the one true God in Jesus Christ whom you sent. How you long for us to partake of the divine nature. How you long for us to love you and abide in you and fulfill this great salvation. How you long for us, Lord God, to love one another out of a pure heart, out of a, you know, out of a true heart, to, to truly uh, enter into the children of God, to become children of the Most High God and to live in the glory of that so that the, the world who is enslaved and captivated in darkness would see the sons of God, the children of God, and say, we need them. Not so that the world will look at the children of God and say, what a disgrace, right? Just like Israel became a disgrace to the nations. The nations marveled at the wickedness and the idolatry of Israel. God forbid that that become our place. God forbid that the church become a disgrace to the, to the lost and dying world. That the world would look at the church and say, what happened to you? God forbid God forbid that anyone would look at me and say, what happened to you? Where's the God of heaven? Where's the God that you proclaim? God forbid. And so, Father, we're here. I ask you, Lord Jesus, please just to animate your word. I ask you, Lord God, to quicken your, our fellowship, our conversation today. We need to be children of God, and children are corrected, trained, disciplined, built up, strengthened, hallelujah. Oh God, show us the glory of correction in the midst of the revelation of the uncorrectable, in the midst of people that we're looking at and are, we're watching and we're even allowing them to lead us, and yet we see them uncorrectable. They refuse to be corrected. They take a position, a posture that says, I don't need correction. God, have mercy on me. God, have mercy on us all. Lord, I need correction. I need to live in the glory of it, the goodness of knowing that anything that the Holy Spirit shows us, we say, yes, Lord. Yes, Lord, deal with it. Deal with it. I'm referring, just thinking back to the mindset, right? Let us glory in judgment. Let us enter in with joy into his judgment. Hallelujah. Oh, Lord Jesus. So right now, Father, we commit our conversation into your hands. We need the anointing of the Holy Spirit to be upon us. We need you to animate our time together today, Lord God. I want to leave a changed man today. I want to leave a changed man today. I want all of, our, all of us, Lord God, to be affected by this word that it will move and touch tomorrow, that we will not be the same. Take this time now, Lord God. It's yours. It belongs to you. I pray the quickening work of the Holy Spirit upon myself as a communicator and upon our fellowship right now in the name of Jesus. We give you praise and bless you. And our hearts are just filled with anticipation. Lord, I love you, Lord. I love you. I love you. I love you, Lord Jesus. I love you, Lord Jesus. Praise your holy name. Amen. We're going to read through uh, the entire chapter of Hebrews 12. Nice. We're not necessarily going to talk about all of chapter 12, but we are going to hear all of chapter 12. My introduction is rooted in watching... The body of Christ, the work of the Holy Spirit right now, one of the things clearly the Holy Spirit is doing is, is revealing the needs of the body. God 
in, in preparation for his return. And God has always done this, right? Generation after generation. But we're this generation. This is our generation. So right now, un, I believe, un, without question, the Holy Spirit is exposing the needs of his people. And what that means is wickedness is going to come to light, right? Just God won't, won't have it. He will not allow wickedness. Those who do the truth come into the light that it may be revealed their works are wrought in God. So if you're if you're if the church isn't living out John three twenty one, then the church is not in Christ, right? It's a mess. If the church is not living in John three twenty one, and I, that I just quoted to you, that is a serious problem for the Holy Spirit. And so that's why we're talking about the glory of correction. And we see, unfortunately, in the midst of wickedness, in the midst of lawlessness, being exposed by the Holy Spirit in the body of Christ in predominant denominations right just everywhere it's like just uh it's like these spotlights coming down from the lord and saying this has to be touched this has to be dealt with and so we're either going to be corrected or we're either or we're not and those who are not correctable those who are not in teachable you know if you're not if you can't be taught the scripture says right here we're going to read it you're a you're not a son you're a bastard Right? You're, you're not worthy. You're not a, you can't be call yourself a child of God and not be correctable. You just can't. Today is about my heart. And over and over again, we need to remember this when we gather. And as we look at one another in love, let us always temper it, right? Uh, uh, Caroline and I recently were praying. We had a, you know, we were in a, a moment of prayer. And it's just the reality of you're praying for situations that you feel strongly about. And then it's just like the Holy Spirit says, yeah, but look, you know, look at you. It's your heart. Your heart. Where is your heart? Where am I in you? And what, and what you understand? Because at the end of the day, that's what the Lord is going to hold us accountable for. I'm not going to stand next to all these other people who are, are in, a, in a terrible place. If anything, I'm going to be standing accountable for my mercy and my long-suffering and my prayer and my intercession on behalf of these people, instead of looking at them with a wagging finger and saying, oh, you know, how could you? I'm accountable to be Christ to the body. Amen? We're, that's it. We're ministering unto one another in love. So, so we're, 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 this is a big deal. And Christ's likeness always, you'll, you, you've heard this from me for 20 years, right? Since we were in ministry. Christ's likeness, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, is way, way beyond what you think it is, right? So you look in the mirror and you say, you look in the Word and you say, you know what, I'm, I think I'm doing pretty good here. And the <laughs> Lord says, oh, all right, <laughs> let's take another look, right? Let me, let's show you the cross. Let me show you my, right, are you really? You think you're doing good? Well, if any man thinks he's something, when he's nothing, he deceives himself. All right, so we're, let's go ahead and read this thing. Uh, and so that's that's my heart. And and let me let me just compliment that and say this. This is what I wish people understood. And I'm not I'm I'm not I don't plan to share much testimony today on Tuesday night for those uh, who are joining us on Tuesday. I shared a lot of testimony this past Tuesday. And in that in the sharing of that testimony, I shared the glory of correction. And what I mean by that is, on the other side of correction is incredible life. The one who draws back from correction, they don't, they don't even understand. Satan has them blind to what they're missing out on the other side of being corrected. Being corrected is the most beautiful, <coughs> glorious gift that God can give us Amen. to get out from under the weight of what sin is, right? The thing that I need to be corrected of, it's killing me, or it's killing my wife, or it's killing my daughter, or it's killing my family, killing my generations, right? Kill on the church. So to come out, to be correctable, when, when correction, when I love correction and I know the glory of it, then everything, I see it through the lens of a gift, of the joy, right? That's what uh, James says, count it all joy when you're proven. Count it all joy when you fall into those trials and them temptations. When you're proven in your heart, your heart is exposed, that should be a joy to you because it means that there's life and completion, you're, you're entering in, James says it this way, count it all joy, right, when you fall into various trials and temptations, knowing the testing of your faith, the trying of your faith produces patience or endurance. 
But let endurance have its maturing. It says perfect work. That word perfect means mature. That ma- let patience or endurance have its maturing work. Do you let endurance have its maturing work? Do you let do you love the maturing work of what it means to be put in the press of the Holy Spirit to have the word come and deal with you? Do you love the dealing of that? Because the writer says, let patience have its perfect work so that you may be mature and complete, wanting nothing. Wanting nothing. You see, the man who, or the woman who wants nothing, who was want for nothing, just like Paul says, right? I know, Paul says, uh, I know that in whatever state to f- I find myself, I can be content. I've learned it. He says, I've learned how to be abased and I've learned how to abound. I know how to live in every condition. Every condition where I'm proven, whether it's by the world out there or the church or anywhere else, any condition that proves me, I know how to be content there. And who wouldn't want that, right? Who wouldn't want the the, the firm, a a foundation that is so firm that we're unshakable? Again, that's what the world's looking for. Look at these people were proven and they were, you know, they can't even, anyways, you get my point, yeah? Okay, Hebrews 12, 1. Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders in the sin that so easily entangles, and let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us. Let us fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, who is the joy set before him endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endured such opposition from sinful men so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. Mm. In your struggle against sin, you have not yet resisted to the point of shedding your blood. And you have forgotten that word of encouragement that addresses you as sons. My son, do not make light of the Lord's discipline and do not lose heart when he rebukes you. Because the Lord disciplines those he loves, and he punishes everyone he accepts as a son. Endure hardship as discipline. God is treating you as sons. For what son is not disciplined by his father? If you are not disciplined and everyone undergoes discipline, then you are illegitimate children and not true sons. Mm. Moreover, we have all had human fathers who disciplined us, and we respected them for it. How much more should we submit to the Father of our spirits and live? Our fathers disciplined us for a little while, as they found thought best. But God disciplines us for our good, that we may share in his holiness. No discipline seeks... That's on to Tim now. Thank you. That's perfect. All discipline for the moment sees seems not to be joyful, but sorrowful. Yet to those who have been trained by it, afterwards it yields the peaceful fruit of righteousness. Therefore, strengthen the hands that are weak and the knees that are feeble, and make straight paths for your feet, so that the limb which is lame may not be put out of joint, but rather be healed. Pursue peace with all men, and the sanctification without which no one will see the Lord. See to it that no one comes short of the grace of God, that no root of bitterness springing up causes trouble, and by it may be defiled. That there be no immoral or godless person like Esau, and sold his own birthright for a single meal. For you know that even afterwards, when he desired to inherit the blessing, he was rejected, for he found no place for repentance, though he sought for it with tears. For you have not come to a mountain, and can be touched, and to a blazing fire, and to darkness and gloom and whirlwind, and to the blast of the trumpet and the sound of words which sound as such that those who heard begged that no further word be spoken to them. For they could not bear 
the command, if even a beast touches the mountain, it will be stoned. All right. And so terrible was the sight that Moses said, I am full of fear and trembling. But you have come to Mount Zion and to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, and to myriads of angels, to the general assembly and the church of the firstborn who are enrolled in heaven, and to God, the judge of all, and to the spirits of the righteous made perfect, and to Jesus, the mediator of a new covenant, and to the sprinkled blood, which speaks better than the blood of Abel. See to it that you do not refuse him who is speaking, for if those who did not escape when they refused him, who warned them on earth, much less will we escape who turn away from him who warns from heaven. And his voice shook the earth then, and now he has promised, saying, Yet once more, I will shake not only the earth, but also the heaven. This expression, yet once more, denotes the removing of those things which can be shaken, as of created things, so that those things which cannot be shaken may remain. Therefore, since we receive a kingdom which cannot be shaken, let us show gratitude, by which we may offer to God an acceptable service with reverence and awe, for our God is a consuming fire. Amen. Very good. Yeah, so those, those, this whole passage just flows. Uh, it's just seamlessly flowing into itself, right? It just The momentum of it just continues uh, coming right out of chapter 11. Chapter 11 is the chapter of faith, right? This, they call it, we call it the chapter of faith of, of all these uh, men and women who, who trusted God, who followed, who yielded, and they lived by faith. They lived by faith, not in themselves. And they, one of the pre- predominant themes of chapter 11 of, of the book of Hebrews is that the thing that animated their faith was not this world. In, if you, we're not going to look at it right now, but in verse 13 of chapter 11 to verse uh, 16, one of the things that, that is amplified there, the writer interrupts his, his examples of faith, and he says the reason that these people endured was because their heart was fixed on a city whose builder and maker was God. They had been converted to where they were headed. Now, this is a really common theme, right, for us since we started here. That's what we've been talking about, converted to eternity, ready and prepared for eternal things. If your heart's not converted to eternity, Mm -hmm. then the work of the Holy Ghost to prepare you, you'll always kick against it. Because the flesh sets its mind, sets its things on, on, it sets its mind on the things of the the earth, right? According to Romans chapter 8, the flesh is carnal. It's not subject to the spirit. It can't be, right? So the flesh is, you can't, if you're, if you're in mixture, if your heart is divided, if you're not converted, then you're, you're, you're living opposed to yourself. And most people don't even recognize that opposition. They don't even recognize their need to deal aggressively with their heart. And that's why we're talking about the glory of correction. The corrected man, when he's done with the correction, it says it yields the peaceable fruit of righteousness. And he's like, oh, oh man, I can't believe I lived any other way, right? I, I trust we've all had that experience where the Lord brought us through a maturing process and we're just like, oh man, what was it? I can't believe I ever lived this th- that other way before. Yeah. Like, what was I thinking, clinging so tenaciously to this to this right or this mindset or this sin or whatever it was, right? It's just like, man, I, I was out of my mind. And you were out of your mind until the Lord transformed you by the renewing of your mind. And then, according to Romans chapter 12, you tested and you proved that good, acceptable, and perfect will of God. And then you loved him, right? Then, you're, you're, again, you're, your affections, even more and more, are turning to eternity. Man, it's so exciting. And so... Uh, I want to start our little discourse here, and uh, this is kind of how I'm, I'm tracking with this thing. Is I, I say we're having a conversation today because you can see how much is, is in this, right? I mean, you know, it would be foolish to try to minister uh, or, or say that, look, I'm, we're going to, you know, exposit this chapter here. But no, no, what we want to do is we just want to have a conversation about the vision of it, the, the, uh, the, 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 the mindset or the heart behind this chapter. And so 
in order for us to do that, I think what, what I'd like to do is I would like us to look at verse uh, 10. All right? In verse 10, we read these words. For they disciplined us for a short time as seemed best to them, but he disciplines us for our good so that we may share his holiness. We may share his holiness. Now, the writer only mentions holiness in passing, although it does come up later. In verse 14, most translations, uh, it says, verse 14, pursue peace with all men and sanctification, or uh, many trans, what does the NIV say? Does it say sanctification or holiness? Without holiness. Yeah. Pursue peace with all men and holiness, without which no man will see the Lord. Right, so there's this, this connection we're, we're, we're amplifying, or we're going to begin our conversation today talking about holiness, because this is the work of correction, of discipline, of training, is to partake, to be a sharer in his holiness. Why is being a sharer in his holiness so significant? Because we're being prepared for eternity, and eternity is a holy place. There's no blasphemer, there's no adulterer, there's no fornicator, there's no liar, there's no adulterer, there's no covetous man. None of these things are in eternity. You're not, right? You, huh? Yay, yeah, amen, yeah. <laughs> but let's, so here's, here's what I, one of the first things I wanted to share with you today, and I really do want to try to have a conversation about this instead of me talking all the time. We haven't done this for a while. But I want us to understand that holiness the biblical principle, let me say it, let me finish my sentence. The holiness is our inheritance, or a, a piece of our inheritance, an element of our inheritance. We have an inheritance in Christ. It's eternal life, right? An, a, an inheritance reserved for us in heaven, the scripture says, reserved for us in heaven. But when you think about the biblical the biblical narrative of inheritance has to do with acquiring, right? With apprehending, you possess your inheritance. In, uh, and so the language, I'm not trying to open this up to the degree that I could, but in Joshua chapter 1, it says, right? Let me just sum it up. Moses is gone. Moses is dead. You're the man, right? This is the Lord speaking. Moses is dead. You're the man. You're going to bring the people in. Be strong and courageous. But the first thing that God says in Joshua chapter 1 to, Mo, to, to Joshua is, everywhere that you set your foot, I've given you that land. That's the principle of inheritance. Everywhere you've set your foot, I've given you that land. Be strong and courageous that you may go in and possess, right? Why, why does the Lord speak this to Joshua? Because he's already given it. Your possession is based on what I've done, not on what you do. You're going into something I've already done. That's the Christian life. You're possessing something I've already accomplished. Jesus said it is finished. We are possessing that which Christ has already made available to us. Yeah. Our possession of that is to the degree that we desire, just like it was for Israel. Israel could have taken the whole land. But by the time you get to the end of Joshua, what do we find? This tribe didn't possess their whole land. This tribe didn't possess their whole land. This tribe didn't possess their whole land. Only Caleb and Joshua possessed their whole land because they were men of faith. They saw the inheritance, and they understood their right of possession. So when we're talking about discipline, the work of God is, I want you to possess everything that I've given you, right? In Christ, Christ's likeness. Romans chapter 8, whom he foreknew, he predestined to be conformed. Predestination is an inheritance, right? He predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son, that you, that he, Christ, might be the firstborn among us, many brethren. So the children should be possessing their birthright. Their birthright is looking like the firstborn. Doesn't that radically kind of, in the moment, does that search you like it searches me? 
When I think, am I possessing all that Christ has made available to me and in, in, in bearing his image? Or is it, have I been sidelined as much of the church is, right? The church is sidelined by all kinds of crazy stuff. And we're all guilty. No one, you know, there's no one who can stand back and say, I got it, I got it going on. But, but at least, may the Holy Spirit at least open our eyes so I can say, oh, wait a minute. Maybe, you know, maybe if I can apply the reality of discipline, maybe I can enter into this thing and be a partaker of his holiness. Maybe I can begin to apprehend that which Christ has made available to me. This is my inheritance. It belongs to me by right. So there's no depression. There's no anxiety. There's nothing in the human condition, no sin. No work of the flesh that should dominate over me. And there's no apprehension of the nature and character of Christ that is necessary, the power of Christ that is necessary to minister the gospel to the world out there, because that is our commission. So with the commission also comes the authority, the inheritance to fulfill the commission. Amen? Because, you know, God help us that Jesus uh, just sends us out there and says, well, you know, good luck. I hope you can do it, right? No, he says, you wait. What do you wait for? What, is, what, what, what does the book of Acts begin with? You wait in Jerusalem, and you wait for that power, right? You wait for that power to fill you, and then you go forth, because that's your possession, right? Go forth and inherit everywhere you set your foot. So I've taught this many times. Everywhere you set your foot in your heart, you should be able to apprehend that. Because nothing can, no devil, no world, nothing can stand against your possession of that which Christ has given you. And he's given you a new heart and a new mind. Amen? The whole thing. So this is a big deal. All right? So this is the kind of conversation I want to have. What do you think about, this is, let's, let's take this as a conversation point. I'll give you a moment to, to reflect. To, I'll set you up with it. <laughs> inheritance, the inheriting of the holiness of God. Now, holiness is not just purity. We're talking about the very, right, holiness isn't just, I don't sin. That's not holiness. Holiness is the, the very existence, the, the full comprehensive existence. Be holy as I am holy. And in the holiness of God is all that, that God is in his attributes, right? The fullness of God is in his holiness. And his holiness is the fullness of God. So yes, it's an absence of darkness. We understand that. But we're also talking about apprehending the very nature of God who, who dwells on the throne, right? So are you seeing that? Or maybe you disagree with me. I don't know. So let's talk about inheritance, that, that element of, of possessing because that, if we don't get this, the reason this is so important is if we don't understand it, then trying to navigate how the strong language that this chapter speaks, this is, this is not weak language, right? You're a, you're a bastard King James language. If you don't, if you don't submit to correction, this, the discipline of the Lord, the, the King James says, you're a bastard, right? You're not a son. And so that's a pretty, <laughs> that's a pretty big deal. So talk to me. What do you hear? What do you hear in that for yourself? And uh, and what do you think? You know, let's encourage one another. Yeah, the inheritance is. Um, I mean, I think when uh, somebody gets to the point where they recognize their their need for God and how wrong they were living apart from Him in darkness, the point to where somebody gets to surrender their life. Is because they they see that new inheritance that's offered to them, but at the same time, they if they receive it, it takes some time, just as children, to be trained in it, Amen. and to appreciate it, and to respect it, and then honor it, to actually start living it. Amen. Um, and I, and I believe for myself, there's so many distractions in life and so many different emotional pulls and pushes and decisions and situations to where sometimes, even though that I'm a child of God, 
I feel like I can't attain that holiness that I know I should be able to inherit because I, I see my flaws yes. or, or, or the distractions in life make me feel like I can never be that good. You know? Um, that's for me anyways. Um, I've been freed. I've been delivered. I've been saved. My life's con completely different than I used to be. But I, I, I still hold on to some doubts. Mm, that's a good word. Because um, I, I never want to come off towards God like I can even compare to how holy he is. Mm. So I think for myself, I maybe, I maybe sacrifice a lot of these gifts and, and these uh, developments in my walk because I feel I'm not worthy to ever compare myself to his holiness. And I'm losing out. Yeah. You know, because Christ wants me to That's right. be there. He wants to show me who I should be. Um, and I, I don't know, but... I don't know if that's a reflection of maybe, as I was growing up, the di discipline that I got from my father. Mm. Either be right, wrong, or indifferent, or too harsh, or whatever the case is. Um, could have a lot to do with me kind of shying away from everything God is offering me because I just feel like like I said earlier about not being worthy. Yeah. Or feeling like I'm even loved that much. Sometimes I can't feel like I know God loves me with all his heart. Sometimes I feel like maybe there's something I need to do better or do more to receive that love when it's already yes. there. Yes, yes, amen. Um, yeah, that, that's good. So... The inheritance, yeah. I mean, we all long for that. Um, I believe it says um, in the word that, you know, we yearn for that. We long for that. Um, but I believe we we got to get beyond the longing and start sitting in it, you know. And uh, that's, I mean, once we get there, then I believe God can use us to do anything. Mm, amen. And then that that will even get, empower our witnessing and uh, yeah, that's right. And uh, you know, being a light to the world. Amen. Uh, mm -hmm. So very good. Well, one of the things that comes to the surface when I hear you share, and I, uh, you can correct me if I'm if I'm hearing this wrong, but we're when we're looking at ourselves, any regardless of the why of looking at ourselves, we know that. The spirit isn't the one doing the work, right? There's, there's, when it, because when, anytime we're trying to please God, the spirit produces something that is, that is innate. It's, it's like a part of who we are. And our nature is, is, we're walking in agreement with the spirit of God to produce out of us the very thing that Christ has given us. So in other words, the Holy Spirit is the life and the power that produces the very thing that has been given to us. In ourselves, when I look at myself, and I can see this over the course of my struggle against sin, always trying to overcome in my flesh, right? Making, being more determined, being, right, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to press into this. Lord, just give me one more chance. I know I can do this. And the truth is, that's so far from the life of the Spirit, the law of the Spirit of life begins, the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus begins with, you can't, I can right? So what we're supposed to do is enter into His rest. Hebrews chapter 3 and 4, talking about the rest, the Sabbath of God, right? We're, we're not, we're supposed to just simply let, and it's not that there's not an engagement of our will. There is an engagement of our will. But it's, a, it's just simply a yielding and, and an entering into 
that which Christ has already done. So even the performance, right? Even that's why the scripture says it's God in Galatians. It says it's God, or maybe Philippians, God who works in us both to will and to do of his good pleasure. Right? So there's, it's God who's changing your heart. He's converting your, your desires. But it's also now God performing the very thing that he's given you, that desire in you. And I think often we sense, and I, I'm, you know, I'm kind of hearing this in your language here, to sharing today too, we, we can all identify with that, man, I really want, I know I should be, right? I really want, but it's the doing that we look. Now we now, instead of looking at Christ and saying, Christ, you do this, because that was your covenant promise to me, that you would give me a new heart, a new mind, that you would cleanse me of all filthiness and idols, that you would, you see what I'm saying? All these covenant promises that you gave me, you're going to now fulfill them. I receive them by faith, and I know you're going to fulfill them, and I'm going to express my agreement in faith by obedience. And in the meeting of those two things, right, the fulfillment of your promise, meeting my obedience, you're going to change me. Versus... Lord, just give me, you know, I'm just going to, I'm trying, I'm trying, Lord. Help me, you know, strengthen me, make me strong, help me. That really isn't biblical. That's not the Christian life. The Christian life is, in my flesh, well, no good thing, right? He's the one who's going to do this. And so the law of the spirit of life is, is that, that, that's a, a, probably one of the biggest challenges of the Christian life is continually striving to change in my flesh. And your flesh can't change. So, I, you, I mean, I really appreciate what you shared there. But that's one of the things that I heard in your sharing is that looking at myself instead of, right? Because we do. We look at ourselves. I mean, I, you know, I, I stumble all the time thinking, and I get bogged down thinking about how wicked I know my heart is. Man, my heart's just not right. Instead of living and abiding in the glory of, I'm clean. My heart's been sprinkled of an evil conscience. I have nothing, right? I'm in right, me and God are in right standing. And if anything rises up in my life, a thought, a deed, a word, something, then I know what to do. I know how to respond. And I should enter back into that place of peace, that place of rest, right? That's why it's the Sabbath. The Sabbath is the Sabbath. It's, it's you've ceased from your own works. He's doing the work, right? Because he finished it. All right, thanks for sharing that, Dana. That was great. Anyone else thoughts on this? Kind of related to what both of you said based on um, verses 1 through 3. First, where 3 says, Consider him who endured such hostility by sinners against himself so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. That's right. Like Jesus suffered the absolute worst suffering so that we don't have to wallow and be like oh i can't fix this i can't do this why can't i just you know i know what i'm supposed to do but I'm not. Right. That's right. and then because of the example of the people who went before us in verse one where it says we have this cloud of witnesses we and because christ christ's victory enables us to do it so seemingly easily, right? It's, I mean, it is, but when, I don't know. When he says, lay aside every encumbrance and the sin that easily entangles us and then run with endurance, the race that's set before us. Like, there's no, it's just like, it's just throwing it off and going. Yes. You know, it's not, I have to, I have to think through it you know, like, I, I don't know, because I, for myself, you do. just thinking yes. from, just thinking for myself, yes. you know, like, you, you feel like just because it satisfies your emotions and your flesh to just like sit and, you know, chew Come on this, you know, rotten thing when the Lord's like, I literally made it possible for you to be so far away from this, That's right. you know, and based on the testimony of everyone before you in the Bible, you know, all these people that what well, all, you know, it's like, has, has he changed at all? No, like none of them had to, you know, sit and think through all their past stuff and, you know, Oh, can I, can I walk in victory? I don't know. You know, can I change? And it's just like, I, it's just, 
It doesn't have to be when it's hard. We say, Lord, like, I mean, just thank you. Thank you for the fact that you're making me more like Jesus. Okay? Yeah. (laughs) You know? And it, it doesn't have to be something that tears us, that brings us down. It it shouldn't because that just kind of takes us backwards and it says we're supposed to run with endurance the race set before us ahead not not that not the other way now we're not and we're not based on what you're saying we're not discarding the power and the value and the mandate really of contrition right and repentance right these are all critical things it's the getting bogged down with when you've already the me of it right when you've already been given, I mean, and you encouraged me in this years ago, where it's like, this is something that's already over. Christ has already brought you out of this, but you're sitting here with it hanging over you for no reason. Yeah. You know, for what reason? Because it feels good to it feel feels bad. Good to you. That's right. It's self pity. It's, it's, it's you a know, bondage. And you think that you're like lingering. I think maybe, you know, we think that we're lingering in a place of feeling remorseful or contrite but it's really just our ego that's right no (laughs) it's hard to say but it's the truth because because it's because god isn't he's not lingering on it you know he's not like oh yes you yes remember when you were (laughs) feeling so bad for your sin (laughs) it was you felt so bad and that was great and let's keep thinking about it he's just like no like jesus why aren't you, you know, there's so much more for you yeah, ahead, you know? Right. You don't well, you think of what, what Jesus it. said to the adulterous woman, right? And, and, and the, you know, in the church, the adulterous woman would have been brought aside and said, now we're going we're gonna to sit down, we're going to talk about your whole past, your whole, right, we're going to get it, we're going to dig into it, we're just going to break all this down, we're going to get into it, we're going to start psycho, you know, psychoanalyzing you, we're going to make sure you understand everything. No, Jesus says, I don't condemn you, Go and sin no more. Right? Go and sin no more. That's it. And and the church just won't have that now. We're so psychologized in the church that is just not permissible to just get up and start walking. Mm-hmm. Until there's someone who actually has that experience and they're like, I'm, what are you I'm not looking back there. What are you yeah. what are you talking about? Yeah, well, I mean I had this experience recently over the past year where like I had I had, you know, I didn't. I knew that I was gonna feel some hurt for a little bit, and I was like, uh, "Okay," but like, I'm gonna forgive and I'm gonna move on. And I'm gonna keep on forgiving whenever I feel gross about it, and you know. But like, and then months later, people who knew the stuff that had hurt me kept on talking to me as if I was still hurt, and it's like I'm right. <laughs> why why do i you know and it's just kind of like i you stop like for me i would stop and i think am i supposed to still feel bad about this right am i supposed to still feel like what was me because like because like i'm okay yeah see that (laughs) that demonstrates the principle right that the the church is kind of obsessed with itself and and thinks jesus is obsessed with all that too it's just like i'm i'm let's go do you want to add no, I was just I was just thinking what she was saying, and um, for myself, even though even when I'm thinking like that, or not obtaining everything that God is offering me, He's still working through me. And there's one accomplishment after another after another through you know the Spirit because it's not me doing it. Amen. So I see things as I grow in Christ; they're just falling at, at the wayside. You know what I mean? Things that I thought I still struggled with. And when I couldn't do it on my own flesh and just gave it to him, now they're being healed. The point I was trying to make was, is um, sometimes it's hard. that The closer I get to be like Christ, the more I start finding people in my life just backing off. You know what I mean? Um, people that ain't saved. I'll say in the church or Christian brothers yeah. or nothing, but family, mm-hmm. friends. Sure. Because the more you become 
more like Christ, yeah. the more it pushes people away. Oh yeah. And the more I find that I'm getting pu people are pushing away and not reaching out and everything else, I'm thinking that I'm doing something wrong, like I'm the bad person. But what it is is they're just seeing more of the glory of God in me, and their spirit can't relate to that. There's no agreement. There's no agreement there. Yeah. And sometimes I have to I have to understand and realize that sometimes when God puts you in a place of isolation, there's a reason. Because it says come out from them. That's right. Right? Absolutely. Do not touch. Do not taste. That's right. So instead of me feeling the negative of like, gee, you know, this one doesn't call me. My wife doesn't really agree with me. This and this and that. I, I supposed to be thanking Jesus for that. But I think with my own human tendencies, mm -hmm. I want to be loved. Yes. And I need people in my life because that's what makes me feel whole. When Christ is like, you don't need any of that. All you need is me. You know, being human and being conformed to the image of Christ is so far from each other. Yes. That sometimes it complicates it. Well, I hope that in our fellowship, in our times, I mean, you know, Dana, what you did, that last thing you just said, that the, there's there's real power in finding anyone else who said who who latches on to where to where you're heading because you, even within the church we you look you're looking around you're like does anyone does anyone think like this does anyone even want what I'm wanting in my heart it seems like there's so few people who desire what I'm desiring and so you feel like kind of like a stranger like you know and so you can either kind of hang out in the midst of in the midst of that lack of identification or um, you know I've heard it said many different ways growth is always going to produce loss so you can enter into gain and those who are gaining what you know where, where you're at you understand what I'm saying it, I mean loss is a part of the Christian life not because you're saying oh I, I hate those people they're just not heading in the same direction or at the same speed whatever the reason right some people just like their mixture <laughs> they just love their mixture I don't I don't like mixture. I don't want mixture. So it doesn't mean that I don't care about you or don't, you know, want a fellowship with you. But as I'm, you know, like you said, you know, I'm moving forward and people are like, you, you become a fragrance of, of death or frustration. You, you, you end up, people end up being offended when you're, right, when, you, when you're walking in a way or in, a, in, in, this, in this particular mindset. Remember the, the, the little title that I gave, right? The Glory of Correction. So as we're reading through this, and we hear, right, let, let me just highlight some things that I underlined here. I, I numbered about nine different things that came to a point um, that, that ended essentially in verse 11. A principle or a thought out there that we can fellowship in, and we can now, we, as we begin to look at the specifics of what correction, how correction works, what correction produces, we want to be in the mindset that says, yes, this is what I want. We want to see the glory of it. Because when you when you see the possession, the inheritance, right, you want to enter in. You want to apprehend that. There's You're animated by the desire. Again, going back to Hebrews 11, right? These all died in faith without receiving the promise, having seen them and having welcomed them from a distance, having confessed that they were strangers and exiles on the earth. For those who say such things, make it clear, they're seeking a country of their own, right? But they desire a better country, a heavenly one. Therefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared a city for them. That's verse that's from 13 to 16 in chapter 11 of Hebrews. That's the, the heart and the mindset that we're striving to lay hold of here. And the writer is setting that in front of us as well, and he's saying, look, Endure, right? This is this is why you're doing this. This is the mindset you want to adopt. This is why we're fellowshipping with one another and encouraging one another. Because we see the glory of this and we see the weight of it. You know, one of the things that this chapter ends up setting out there is saying, look, 
if you reject the opportunity to be corrected, if you don't see the privilege and the glory of correction, it's a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God, right? Our God is a consuming fire. So don't play. Don't think that you avoiding, right, uh, correction and discipline, the discipline of the Lord, don't think that, that's, that, that the Lord doesn't see that or isn't going to be persistent in his engaging with you in that area that's causing you to stumble and frustrating your apprehension of his holiness. It says without holiness, no one's seeing the Lord. Now we say, well, I'm holy in Christ. Yes, you are. But you can't be holy in Christ and live like the devil, right? You're not going to possess if you're out there living like the world. You're just not. So we want to see the glory of this. Apprehend the heart. And, and uh, again, I think, you know, Dina, you say, well, I, that's why I, I think it's so, the fellowship uh, of people who are heading in that direction is so wonderful. Um, and I, I pray that we experience a coming together in that, in that, that this is just common. You know, one of the world that when you think about, when I think about as, you know, pastor, right? As when I think about the heart of this place and why we gather, there's a very long-term goal and vision, and that is to fall in love with the Christian life as God has actually given it to us, right? Not into the religious forms and cultures that end up coming up short or that bind people together at, in a place of below this. We're talking about a high bar here, but the high bar is not so we can say, well, look, look at what we've attained. It's like, man, this is life or death to me. If I don't get there, right, I'm, I'm going to lose it. I need this. I need this life. I want to be holy as he is holy. I love being holy as he is holy. I love fellowshipping with people who are in that mindset. And again, it's not about disregarding those who are not. Rather, may they be hungry. May they become hungry and see, oh, I'm seeing a quality of life, an authority in your life in ministry that I don't have, right? May they see the power and the authority of Christ working through us. Why? Because that is where Christ flows from. Christ, you know, you're either a vessel sanctified unto honor or you're not a vessel sanctified unto honor. Vessels sanctified to dis or, or dishonorable vessels, the Lord can't use you. He can't. He can't use a dishonorable vessel. No, you have to be sanctified unto honor, which is, of course, what we're talking about, working in this place of agreement with the Lord. And so, uh, yeah, that's the heart, man. That's that's what I got. So I said, we read the whole thing. I had no intention of trying to get into it, and I feel like it would be be an okay time to to just ask the Lord to help us with this, right? To to And, you know, whether we look at this next week or we go to somewhere else, I'm just trying to be led of the Holy Spirit every week. This was very much on my heart today. And so thinking, just sharing, maybe in closing, I'll share. You have to understand by testimony, I have had to really be disciplined by God. Right? Really, I mean, really disciplined by the Lord because of my lawless, rebellious, selfish heart. I want what I want. I want it when I want it. And I don't care if anyone pays the cost, right? I don't care. I'll trample all over you. Trample all over. It just that's, that's the mindset and the heart of wickedness that God is still bringing me out of. Now, thank God, you know, all of us, none of us are where we were, right? But when you, when you, for example, when you've lived a life like mine, right? You, were the, you, you went through a season in my life. I went through a season where Lord, the Lord brought me to the threshold of deliverance. He delivered me from something that 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 had ensnared me, had had held me in, in bondage for many, many years. He delivered me, and then I walked in freedom. And then I returned to the thing that I was a slave to. That's a that's. And so when you demonstrate that you're so rebellious, that you're willing to go back to where you were, that the Lord set you free from, whew, I'm just telling you, the Lord says, okay, uh, uh, whom I love, I discipline, and I rebuke every son, right? I chasten every son. And, uh, you know, it is for discipline you endure. But here's the beauty of it. Let's close with this. 
just to refresh ourselves in it. Uh, this is the quote from the Old Testament. My son, and we read it in Proverbs 3, remember? Remember in Proverbs 3 that, that Dana read for us earlier? Right? Whom the Lord loves. My son, do not disregard lightly the discipline of the Lord, nor faint when you are reproved or rebuked by him. For those whom the Lord loves, he disciplines, and he scourges every son whom he receives. The proverb says he scourges, and that word scourge means exactly what it means. Strong punishment, strong discipline. It's a strong hand. But he does that. Why? Because according to Proverbs 3, he's a father in whom, he, in whom we, he delights in us. The father delights in us. And so therefore, because the father has a side of us that most often we don't have. If we did, we'd respond far different, right? So when you take, you, you used a word earlier today, Dana, you used the word taste. It was a little while ago. I love that word because when you taste, the scripture says, taste and see. The goodness of the discipline of the Lord. That's the glory. The goodness of God coming to meet me in this place. Even, right, what is mercy? It's God not giving to me what I deserve. I deserve, right? I deserve a cross. I deserve death. And yet the Lord reveals his love to me. He shows us this cross and says, look what I did, Doug. Look what I did, right? I love you. I'm for you. I'm not against you. Let's do this. Amen. It's this glorious work of the Holy Spirit. And I pray that we're experiencing that individually with God, to, you know, one, with one another, but also corporately. That's what I, I long for, is a people who are longing, you know, just loving, heading in this direction. That's my prayer, man, is that we, we just fall in love with this. And that's, you know, it's going to take time because these messages and this kind of mindset, because it is uncommon, uh, and we're, you know, it just is. It's uncommon. So because it is uncommon, making that common in our midst takes time. It just takes time. So I'm excited. I am. I'm, I'm, I'm so excited, man. I, I just love God, and I love you, and I, 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 I hope that you're excited. I'm excited about what God's doing, man.